What's happening is this. You have to stare hard, I admit. Uh, you're looking down a microscope right now. You're looking at some, um, weirdly, some highly diluted milk. Now, if any of you know anything about the, uh, the molecular structure of milk and the fact that it's diluted, um, you might be able to guess what those weird particles are and what solution they're sitting in. If it's highly diluted, what do you think the solution is? It's water, correct. What are these molecules in there? Milk. It's the milk, but particularly it's the fat in the milk, right? So, yeah. Now, I want you to look closely at what those molecules of fat are doing. What language are you use to describe what's happening right now? Vibrating. They're vibrating. What else would you use? That's very, that's very specific language. I would have said they're jiggling, right? They're just like wobbling around, yeah? Now, here's the really weird thing. You're looking down a microscope at a solution that's not moving, at least to our eyes. It's been kept very still, and yet we can't help it from moving around. Right? And this is a very specific kind of motion. Does anyone know what kind, what name we give to this, by the way? It starts with a B. Named after a botanist who discovered it looking at pollen, not milk. Brownian motion. Please write that down for me, please. Brownian motion. You didn't expect to come here getting a physics lesson, but you're getting one because what Brown the botanist saw when he looked at this was, he was looking at pollen, like I said, not, not fat, but this is just a really easy way to see what's going on. He said, why, why are these things that I'm looking at under the microscope, why are they moving? Like everything is completely still, as still as I can possibly make it. Why are they moving about? And eventually it came upon some guy that you might have heard of. His name was Einstein. He said, actually, I know exactly why those are moving in that way. There is something invisible, literally invisible to our eyes through this scale of microscope that must be pushing on each of these different molecules because he knew from physics, right? Things do not move unless a force acts on them, right? Inertia. There must be something acting upon these small invisible particles that we can't see. And so what Einstein did was he went and mathematically, not because he had a good enough microscope, nor did Browning, he mathematically proved the existence of atoms from looking at this motion. Just think about what he did and how that's relevant to this. We don't see any roots, right? They're invisible to us. But everything that we know from older mathematics tells us there has to be something that apparently we can add, apparently we can multiply, that gives us something reasonable. So, here's what we're going to do. Let's take this, uh, uh, this equation here, right? We said y equals, and then we used that to graph, right? To solve this equation, to find these roots that don't exist, all I need to do is let y equal 0, right? That's how I find x-intercepts. So let's go ahead and do that. If I'm solving this equals zero, I can just go through exactly the process that I went through before. I can separate out, complete the square, factorize, and all the rest. I should end up, if I'm following those steps, with everything except for that y being there. It should be zero, right? So I should end up here. Do you agree? Yeah. Now, normally at this point, and especially because we know what the graph looks like, right? Normally at this point, we would say, ah, flip the table and walk off. No solutions. But we're trying to push on this and say, but there must be something. Something's pushing on these molecules, right? So let's conceive of something that can do that. In order to get at a solution for x, what would we normally do at this point if we had like a reasonable number like 3 there? What would we do? Yeah, we take the square root of both sides, or we've already done it to this side, um, and we would say, oh, well, it's going to be plus or minus, by the way. That's square root of whatever's there. Okay? Well, if we have a negative there, let's see what happens if this is the case. Some weird invisible object we've never dealt with before. Okay? Let's just call that a number. Like, I don't know what it means. I don't know where it is. But if it is a number, then I get a solution for x, like this. It's not in the natural numbers, or the rational numbers, or the integers, or the irrational numbers. It's somewhere else. It's in a place as many of you anticipated, that we call the complex numbers. Now, when we say complex, and by the way, hands up who's heard this phrase before? Hands up. I expect most of you. OK, thank you. When we say complex, um, we don't mean complicated and messy and difficult. What we mean is, um, like I do, you might live in a complex. 
And what that means is your house doesn't stand on its own as a separate house. It's attached to other people's houses as well. And that's what you can see here. This number that you know about, you're like I'm cool with this number, it's an integer. It is attached to this other weirdo looking number that I don't know really what to do with yet. Okay? But the fact that they, they must interact gives us these results and I'll prove it. Let's have a think about this. What would alpha plus beta mean if I contend that alpha and beta are these guys? Okay? What happens when you add these? Here's, let's just call this one, let's just call that one alpha, is that okay? And let's just call this one, you might want to jot this down with me, right? You might want to call this one beta, alpha and beta. I'm just adding them, right? Well, even though I don't know what this square root of negative three is, right? The most basic thing you can see, wrong color, is that you've got a minus one here, and you've got a plus one here, right? So what happens when you add a number to its negative? They cancel out. So these guys are just going to go. Is that okay? So then what do you end up left with? Negative. Yeah, negative one plus negative one, that's negative two, like you saw before. Okay. What about this one? Hmm. Let me take a moment and shut up and see what you do with it. If we call this alpha and call this beta, what emerges when you try the working? See what you come up with? Call one of us over if you get an answer or get stuck. I noticed several of you as I was going around, right? You kind of looked at this and after you got over your initial revulsion of like negatives on the square roots, you're like, let's, let's just work with this. Um, you, a lot of you just distributed, you expanded as far as you go. Um, one of the things you will notice and we will consistently say is that mathematicians, famously lazy, always looking for the laziest, lowest effort way to do things. So when I look at this thing, I notice before I go to expand, that this is not just a random thing to expand, right? Um, it's in a particular format that I recognize from like year eight, year nine. It's a number, take away something, and then the same number plus something. What do we call that, by the way? This has a name, it starts with a C. We call them, we used it under, well, with irrational numbers. This is, this is difference of squares because these two things are called conjugates. Does that ring a bell? Yes. Conjugates? Oh. You're like, ah! <laughs> From three years ago? Okay, now, when you've got conjugates and you multiply them yeah. together, yeah, um, what is a minus b times a plus b? What's it factorized to? Yeah. It's a squared minus b squared, right? That was an easier way than expanding the whole thing, yeah? So hopefully what you got was this. Negative one squared, that's a squared, right? Did I get that right? Take away, and then this weird looking b thing, this. Squared. Now, even though I'm still a little confused about what on earth this thing is, I know by definition that what a square root is, is that if you multiply it by itself, you'll get that thing underneath the square root. Do you agree? Square root 25 is 5 because 5 times 5 gives you 25. So therefore, I'll sneak it just up here. Negative 1 all squared is 1. Then you're taking away what? Negative 3. Negative 3, because you squared it, you got, you got the negative back somehow. That, of course, gives you the 4 that we had earlier. Does this make sense? So these complex numbers, what we say is there is a part to them, and I'll highlight it just here, there's a part to it that we are fairly happy with. This is a real number, right? It doesn't have to be... Um, a whole number, it doesn't have to be an integer, it could be like a half or it could even be, it could be irrational stuff there as well, but it's real. And then you've got this other thing, we call this imaginary. A real component and an imaginary component, you put them together and that's what gives you a complex number.